Um, it gives me great pleasure to have Professor Nancy Lynch, someone I have, whose work I have studied for many, many, many years, uh, uh, to be our distinguished speaker. She's the second distinguished speaker for this year. And uh, Professor Nancy Lynch is the NEC Professor of Software Sciences and Engineering at MIT in the ECS, uh, as well as in the uh, CSAIL School of um, you know, uh, Artificial Intelligence in la the lab. Um, Nancy has had a very distinguished history in um, of distributed computing. Um, almost every one of us at some point or the other in some class, if not now, in the past, have learned of her impossibility results. And today she's actually going to go over several of those impossibility results as well um, in her talk. I explicitly remember one of her pieces of work, which was an uh, early piece of work which said 101 impossibility results in distributed systems, and uh, um, essentially there are some core results that, you know, for people working in distributed systems, we should be trying to understand what those results are. Um, Nancy got her PhD and, uh, from MIT and a bachelor's uh, from Brooklyn College, both in math. So she comes in from a very theoretical uh, basis of trying to understand distributed algorithms and looking at it from a theoretical perspective. She's worked a lot on, as I said, the uh, trying to prove results uh, associated with safety and liveness of distributed systems. She's looked at um, developing models of uh, formal models for uh, understanding and reasoning about distributed systems. But I think she may talk a little bit about the time IO automata and time IO automata model today. Yeah. Um, one of the most famous results the, in fault tolerant computing is the FLP impossibility result. The L stands for Lynch, and I think Nancy will be talking about that today as well as other results. She has a whole bunch of um, awards, and I'm going to read some of them. Uh, she's won the Dijkstra Prize, the Knuth Prize, the Athena Award, the Peoria Award, the IEEE Technical Committee on Distributed Processing Outstanding Achievement Award, the Van Wyn Garden Award. She's a fellow of the uh, a ACM, uh, ACM, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academies of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, and so on, and so on, and so on. <laughs> we, um, so she, we are very happy to have her here today, and she's uh, going to talk to us about some of her broad scope of the work on theoretical views of distributed systems. Actually, this is a version of a talk that I gave uh, for International Conference on Distributed Computing Systems. This was a, an award, which, as far as I could tell, was sort of like a lifetime achievement award. Okay, I'm going to muck up a closer. So basically, uh, for this award, I, I went back and reviewed uh, decades of papers to try to find some interesting highlights and uh, construct a story that's uh, <coughs> coherent. So I thought you might enjoy hearing about that. Um, OK, so uh, we've worked on theory for distributed systems. And the idea is to try to understand in mathematical terms the capabilities and limitations of distributed systems. So the flavor of this work is you define abstract models for problems that are solved by distributed systems and for the algorithms that are used to solve them. Along the way, we developed some new algorithms of our own. Uh, we did a lot of work on uh, writing proofs, producing proofs of correctness, also of uh, performance and fault tolerance. And then we proved uh, some impossibility results and lower bounds, which basically give inherent limitations of distributed systems for solving these problems. And uh, then, um, underlying all of this, we developed some formal foundations for modeling and analyzing distributed systems. Uh, just to make this a little more concrete, the kinds of systems we consider are mostly distributed data management systems. Uh, but more recently, we've been looking at wired and wireless communication systems and uh, very recently biological systems, for example, insect colonies, 
uh, developmental biology and brain networks. Okay, so in this talk, I'm, this is a very broad overview. I'm going to talk about some work on uh, distributed, traditional distributed systems, some impossibility results, say a little bit then <coughs> about foundations, and about some of the newer work. Most of the time I'll spend on the first two of these. Okay, oh, so th this talk has a lot of uh, slides with references. So this is for students if you're interested in looking at some of this uh, background, but the ones that are in blue are the ones I'm actually going to say something about. So, um, okay, our, our work on algorithms for distributed systems began with uh, studies of uh, the costs of achieving mutual exclusion. Um, and from, um, from that we moved to considering um, uh, distributed network protocols involving problems like consensus, approximate consensus, clock synchronization, and that's where we got interested in issues of processor failure, including Byzantine failures, um, and we were inspired in, in a lot of this by the work of uh, Leslie Lamport. Okay, so uh, the paper that, um, yeah, so the, uh, the papers that are listed here are uh, on uh, clock synchronization and approximate agreement. Um, but the one I'm going to spend a few slides on a few minutes talking about is the last one uh, with Cynthia Dwork and Larry Stockmeyer on consensus in the presence of partial synchrony. I was just telling people at lunch that this is a paper that had like 10 citations every year forever, and last year got 150. So something is happening. This has uh, been discovered. And it's been discovered in, in the context of uh, algorithms like blockchains. Okay, so here's, this is actually from a citation for a prize, uh, the Dijkstra Prize that this paper was awarded. So the paper introduces practically motivated models between synchronous and asynchronous in which you can actually solve consensus. Now remember, we had previously shown that consensus is unsolvable in asynchronous systems, even with uh, very simple kinds of failures. So how do you get around that? You have, have to build these systems. But the idea is that uh, the citation says that this uh, uh, paper gave the right kinds of tools for building fault-tolerant systems. And the key idea is that the safety properties should be maintained always in spite of um, the, the impossibility of consensus. And uh, progress is what can wait until the system is stable. So you can always maintain the, the critical safety properties, but you can wait to get termination or other types of liveness properties until a period where the system is stable. And then this goes on to say that this is now a way that fault tolerant systems are being built. All right, so just for review, a distributed consensus is basically a problem where you have a bunch of processors in a distributed network that want to agree on a value, uh, where everybody starts with some preference and then uh, they have to agree on uh, some common value, but some of the processors might be faulty. And they, many different kinds of failures have been considered. Could be just they could stop without warning, or they could be malicious, uh, do something more uh, extreme. Uh, but in the end, you want all the non-faulty processors to agree, and you also want to have the value make some sense. For example, if everybody has the same initial value, that should be the decision value. Okay, so this problem originally arose in the context of uh, database commit. Uh, you have to agree on whether a transaction is going to be um, uh, committed or aborted. But it also uh, arose in process control. The Byzantine agreement problem actually arose originally for uh, reaching consistent um, decisions about uh, altitude sensor readings. Okay, so our, contr our uh, contribution in our paper was we looked at a whole lot of uh, these uh, different models of uh, synchrony, different degrees of synchrony, um, and a, a bunch of different failure models. But for all of these, we were able to get algorithms that can reach agreement. Okay, and the way um, what we're guaranteeing is you always get agreement and validity, but your termination may depend on when the system uh, behavior stabilizes. So the, the key ideas of the algorithm are. Different processors can uh, take charge of reaching agreement in a rotating fashion. But since they're all, uh, different ones are trying to reach agreement, you have to make sure they don't reach contradictory uh, decisions. So you need some mechanism to reconcile <coughs> the different decisions. Okay, so just for an example here, uh, imagine just simple stopping failures 
and uh, you're working in synchronous rounds. Messages can be lost, but let's say that from some time on, global stabilization time, all the messages between the non-faulty processors do get delivered. You don't actually need this to be forever, but just long enough for the algorithm to terminate. Okay, so this is just a picture of how the algorithm operates. It's basically uh, operating in four round phases where one coordinator is taking charge of the phase. Um, and a processor can lock a value with a certain phase number, which means that it thinks that the coordinator might decide that value at that phase. And the phase has four rounds. Round one, the processor sends their acceptable decision values um, to the, the coordinator. Acceptable just means uh, they know it's somebody's initial value, and the sender doesn't have a lock on a different value. Okay, then the coordinator looks to see if there's some value it can propose, which is something that is acceptable to a majority of the processors. In round two, you broadcast, the coordinator broadcasts the proposed value, and the recipients will lock that value if they receive his message. Um, in round three, the ones who succeeded in locking the value will send acknowledgments. And now if the process that's coordinating this receives a majority, it will decide on that value. And round four has some cleanup and ex releasing old locks, etc. So that's the basic style of the algorithm. I certainly don't expect you to follow like, why it's correct or anything, but that's uh, how the algorithm operates. It's just the communication pattern used in the algorithm. OK, so um, some of the ideas here were inspired by Dale Skeen's uh, protocol for three-phase commit and uh, the Paxos consensus protocol that you might have heard of by Leslie Lampert uses, came later, but uses uh, some very similar ideas. Okay, so uh, a lot of the work that we did in this, this general area of uh, system algorithms uh, involved doing modeling of, of real systems uh, people were building, trying to understand what they were supposed to do and how the algorithms work. So I'm just going to mention uh, two things here. One is a, a large project we did on a concurrency control algorithm for nested transactions. And another one is on distributed shared memory. I won't have time to go into the third uh, problem on group communication, but there's slides here if you want to see them later. Okay, so for concurrency control for nested transactions, so we basically did a book which uh, summarizes what's in a, a lot of research papers. So what was going on here is there's a lot of work on database transactions uh, which are supposed to execute a bunch of operations, usually reads and writes, on uh, uh, distributed data. Um, it's supposed to make a whole series of um, operations execute as if they were all one great big atomic operation called a transaction. Concurrency control is just the algorithms that are used to make it look like you actually have atomic transactions. Okay. So Barbara Liskoff, uh, so these transactions were studied by Bernstein and Goodman, by Jim Gray, were around for a long time. Barbara Liskoff extended this to nested transactions, where a transaction can have not just operations, but subtransactions, and they can have further subtransactions. Where each, um, at each level, all the transactions at that level are supposed to uh, be executed in some order and should all look atomic. Okay, so th there were uh, systems to implement nested transactions. Liskov had a system called Argus. But there are many systems papers, and there are real implementations, but there wasn't any theory associated with this. So our contributions were to model uh, these uh, systems in a rigorous way, uh, describe the algorithms, generalize some of them, and then show how you can prove them correct. And so we had many, many papers about this. Um, in our book, we actually proved a general uh, theorem about atomicity. It provides a compositional method for proving correctness of concurrency control algorithms. And then you can see all these different kinds of algorithms that were uh, in use at that time, lock-based algorithms, timestamp, combinations of those, optimistic algorithms, algorithms that manage orphans, which are children or descendants of aborted transactions, which still could do some damage. Um, replicated data management. 
So we described all of these and uh, can model them and, and prove that how they work. And so you, you do this all in terms of a general mathematical framework that we use called Iowa Tamada. Okay. All right. So if you're interested, you can certainly find out a lot more about that. Um, the next project that I wanted to mention was um, uh, just a particular paper on a particular uh, algorithm. This is with Alan Feckett on Franz uh, Kashuk. And this is about implementing uh, consistent, sequentially consistent shared objects uh, in a distributed system. Okay, so um, sequentially consistent means it's essentially supposed to look like uh, centralized shared memory, but we're going to implement this over a, a distributed system using broadcast and point-to-point -point communication at the bottom level. Okay, so we're we're basically looking at an algorithm that implements this type of uh, sequentially consistent read update. You have read operations, and then you have updates, which are a combination of reading and writing. Um, and you're doing this over a substrate that has both broadcast and point-to-point -point communication services. This was provided by an operating system called Amoeba. Um, and the approach is based on the one used in the Orca system at the time by um, Tannenbaum, uh, Henri Ball, and uh, um, uh, Andy Tannenbaum. Um, and this was a uh, system for writing applications for clusters of workstations. So briefly, what Orca did was define, split the problem up. They defined an abstract multicast channel, which has very strong, or it's a communication channel, but it, ha it gives you strong guarantees of ordering and preserving causality. And they showed how to implement the multicast channel over the basic broadcast and point-to-point -point communication services. This is using a protocol that's based on, on sequence numbers. And then they show how you implement the sequentially consistent shared memory over any multicast channel. And that uses a replicated data management strategy. So this picture sort of shows how you take the, the multicast channel implementation, use that to build a, an abstract channel with strong properties, and then you implement the sequentially consistent shared memory on top of that, and that's what the client sees. Okay, so we worked with the systems developers. We specified the message delivery and the ordering requirements of the multicast channel first. And then we defined um, a sequence number based uh, algorithm to implement the multicast channel over the basic communication services. And this is like the one used in the Orca system. And then we tried to prove the algorithm correct, but it didn't work. So we discovered an algorithmic error in the actual uh, system, in the Orca implementation. It was just something um, easy to miss. They forgot to piggyback some sequence numbers on certain messages that they, that they needed to. It was an easy fix, because they, they then just added the sequence numbers, but it was um, you know, a mistake in the actual implemented system. And uh, I remember Andy Tannenbaum's comment on this was basically, uh, did you really find that using theory? <laughs> okay, so the error got fixed in the system, and then we were able to complete the proof. Okay. So, uh, oh, all right. So then, um, that, this is what we did at the low level. Then for the higher level, we defined a version of the partial replication algorithm. So here we could generalize. We made a you know, more elegant, more general version of the algorithm in the Orca system. And we proved that that gave you uh, sequential consistency. Along the way, we developed a nice proof technique for proving sequential consistency. And again, all this is based on this substrate of, of automata. All right, so this is what I promised you I would not talk about. So this is um, group communication services. This is continuing our effort to understand data management systems mathematically. So we moved on to study group communication services, which were very popular in the 90s, uh, led by uh, Ken Berman and his work on the ISIS system. Okay, and uh, again, for this, we uh, modeled the system, uh, tried to prove we modeled what it's supposed to do, we modeled the system, tried to prove it correct, found that it was wrong, found, found an error, the error was fixed. 
and then you can finish the proof. Okay, so for this type of work, um, the brief summary is that we use these automata-based formal methods to model and verify many uh, distributed data management systems, especially ones that have strong uh, consistency requirements. So this meant that we had to specify the needed properties in a formal way, define abstract versions of the, uh, the, the algorithms that were actually <coughs> implicit in the systems, uh, we had to clarify ambiguities and prove them correct, and sometimes we found mistakes. Okay. And then uh, one more thing in this uh, section on systems algorithms is an algorithm of our own. Yeah. So the mistakes that you're finding, are they more at the conceptual level or the algorithmic level or at the code level? <coughs> algorithm. Yeah, there, there were uh, errors in the algorithms. When you try to abstract and prove the algorithm correct, you say, like, you forgot a message or, yeah. I see. Yeah. Other questions? All right, so this is um, an algorithmic contribution now. Um, the picture actually is from a news story that they did for uh, at MIT News uh, Magazine. Uh, it shows a centralized memory that's being implemented on a bunch of mobile devices. That's cute. Okay, so this paper's on Rambo, which is a, a reconfigurable atomic memory service for dynamic networks. Now you're talking about a network where the participants are changing, and you still want to uh, get the effect of having a centralized memory. Okay, good. So we're, we're going to implement atomic read-write uh, shared memory in a dynamic network. So atomic memory is supposed to look like centralized <coughs> shared memory. But now the participants in the algorithm can join or leave or fail during the computation. So this is uh, this makes sense in mobile networks, peer-to-peer -peer networks. So we'd like to get high availability. We'd like good good latency, but we'd like to maintain the safety property of atomicity in spite of all of the asynchrony and all the change in the system. We'd still like to get good performance under reasonable limits on asynchrony and change. So this follows the same theme as the uh, dwork uh, lynch stuckmeyer paper. Okay, you guarantee the safety properties, but you, you do the best you can in terms of performance. And, and the applications we thought of originally are um, soldiers in a military operation. Um, this was like when, right after 9-11 and the Afghan war was starting, and, and wonder how would they communicate as soldiers are in a strange location. Uh, but it also makes sense in non-military settings, like first responders in a uh, natural disaster. Okay, so um, <clears throat> maybe this is review. Uh, the ideas start with work by Atia Barnoy and Dolev way back in 95. So they implemented atomic memory, read-write memory, but in static networks. Okay, the idea is they define read quorums and write quorums of processors. You can think that they're all majorities, but you have some flexibility here. Okay, you replicate the objects that you're trying to implement at all the nodes in the network, and they have some version tags associated with them. Now if you want to read, you contact a read quorum to determine the latest version that you can find, and then you want to return that, but for technical reasons, you first propagate that to a write quorum to help, a lot, help uh, disseminate the value to, uh, it within the system. To write, you have to contact a read quorum again, but that's just to determine the largest tag so that you can pick a bigger one. Okay, so you pick a bigger tag, and then you write that tag and your own new value to a write quorum. So this is, these are operations interleaving at an extremely fine granularity. Uh, but it's still, they can all proceed concurrently and you still get atomicity. This is kind of nice. So now our extension of this is the Rambo algorithm, which stands for Reconfigurable Atomic Memory for Basic Objects, that means read-write objects. So now, in addition to doing reads and writes, you want to be able to reconfigure. So we use configurations. Configuration consists of a bunch of processors, that's the set of members. And it has read quorums and write quorums that just go with that configuration. So if the configuration changes, you can get a whole new set of members and new sets of quorums. 
Okay, so the objects get replicated at the members of the configuration. The reads and writes access quorums of the configuration, just as in the static algorithm. Um, and that's enough to handle small changes, transient changes. But when you want um, larger changes that are more permanent, you want to reconfigure, change the configuration to a new one, um, and move the object copies to the members of the new configuration. Okay? So basically, we divide up the algorithm into a main algorithm, which does the reading and writing, and uh, a reconfiguration service. The reconfiguration service is actually uh, producing a sequence of configurations. You have to agree on what's the new configuration. And in there, you have a kind of consensus, a need for a sort of consensus. Okay? So the recon service supplies the configurations based on some requests. The main algorithm is responsible for all the details. It handles all the reading and writing of the objects. It also can garbage collect old configurations in the background when they're not needed any longer. And it reads and writes. When you, they do a read and write, you might not just use one configuration. You might use several if there are several that are currently active. So that's kind of the key idea. If you're changing over from one configuration to another, a read or a write operation that's happening uh, can use both of the, the old and the new configuration. It's just like contacting more processors. Yeah. Yeah, so is this sort of like the memory counterpart for something like extended virtual synchrony where you walk through a series of configurations before you agree on a final membership or something in Well, uh, it might be. There's, um, there's a place where you're looking for a fixed point. Is that what you're talking about? Oh. Yeah, you're trying to come up, you know, you have a partition in a network and then you're trying to come up with what would be a meaningful configuration where everybody agrees on. Um, when you're doing yeah, the, the, reliable um, multicast. The agreement part of it is inside the recon service, and that's going to be some kind of consensus protocol. Right. Uh, so that's going to be expensive. But the, the rest of it, once you have these possible configurations, uh, that's going to be just like in the TFR Noido lab. I'll say a little bit more now. I guess you'll see more details. But you're still going to get all these activities going on concurrently and they interleave at this really fine level of granularity, and you still guarantee the basic safety property of atomicity. Okay, so reads and writes, um, you have a two-phase protocol. In the first phase, and this is just high level and rough, first phase, you co they collect object information from read quorums, but of all the known possible active configurations. In phase two, they propagate the latest object information to write quorums of all the known active configurations. Okay. Lots of operations can be going on concurrently. The quorum intersection properties, every two, every read quorum intersects every write quorum, um, guarantees is what helps you guarantee atomicity. And here, um, so as you are accessing uh, the, all the configurations you know about, you may learn about new ones during the course of, uh, of communicating with, with some of the members. So you bring them into consideration as well. Well, this shouldn't go on forever. You can terminate when you reach a fixed point condition uh, where you've managed to contact a quorum from every known active configuration. Right? You, keep, you might hear about new ones, and then you have to include them too, but at some point you should have heard from quorums of every known active configuration. Okay. And then you do something interesting to remove the old configurations. Otherwise, you'd just be accessing more and more configurations. We're going to have like a garbage collection procedure that works in the background. So that's another two-phase protocol. In phase one, you look at a bunch of old configurations you're trying to garbage collect and move on to a new configuration. For each old one, you have to tell a right quorum of the old one about the new configuration. So if anybody tries to contact them, okay, they can steer them to the new configuration. Um, and you have to collect the object information from a read quorum of the old configuration. Once you do that, you can propagate this latest object information to a right quorum of the new configuration, and then you're free to ignore all the old configurations. So once you've moved enough information along, 
to a new configuration, you can garbage collect the old ones. And again, this all goes on concurrently with the reads and writes, interleaving fine granularity, and you still get atomicity. Okay. All right, so implementing the reconfiguration part, now that gets more expensive, things aren't so interleaved. You use consensus to determine the successive configuration. So that's a, a heavyweight uh, mechanism. Consensus is expensive, and you might have to wait for the system to stabilize. But notice that we're only using this for reconfigurations, which are supposed to be infrequent operations. This is not delaying the routine read-write operations. Okay, so we kind of pulled out the need for consensus out of the main operations. Okay, so implementing consensus, well, we know how to do that. We can use the DLS protocols that I told you about, or we could use Paxos, where you guarantee agreement and validity always, but you guarantee termination just when the uh, system stabilizes. So I understand this. Is this being done per object? You can do it, as, you can group objects. the objects together, or you could use different configurations for different objects if you like. No, because <clears throat> if you do it for a group of objects, right, the cost would be extremely high. Because you'll have to sort of, when you're changing the configuration, I'm assuming that somehow the changes are not allowed. Like you have a right quorum or something like that, right? Uh -huh on the object, which will imply nobody else can access the object. Well, you might want to have write quorums. Um, no, no, th these are not locks. The, the quorums, you just hear from them, but they don't lock anything. You just ask them what's their latest value, or you tell them a value. Then, no yeah, how will you ensure that there's consistency? Like, it'll be a That's the trick, yeah. I see. This is, a, it's kind of amazing, and I would start with the Atiyah Barnoidola to see why it works when you can ah, interleave. Ah. Just, the only thing that's, that's um, done Indivisibly, in that is like individual messages sent to one one node, and then they send a message back. But there's there's no uh, no locking going on. So the other part would be that you're maintaining probably some state or metadata about the objects and where the what the configuration is. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't the cost of that be very high if you do it at the individual object level? Yeah, that, that would be more costly. That's why you would try to you might try to aggregate it as, as would make sense. Uh, you know, to do many objects together. The metadata could be reused. Okay. Okay, so again, we did all this using uh, the automata. <coughs> and yeah, we have a, this nice partial order based method for proving atomicity, which we find convenient. Uh, we've come back to that in you know, many recent papers. Uh, Ji Ying's been involved in some of those, right? So, uh, where you're trying to do uh, even methods that use uh, a coding to store data, and you still, it's very complicated, but you still want to guarantee atomicity. So there's a proof technique that you can use to help you uh, show that. Okay, just uh, some perspective. Uh, comparing the, this algorithm with Paxos, uh, so Paxos uh, requires consensus to be used on every single operation, whether it's a read, write, or a reconfigure. He puts them all together. Um, so completion of every single operation depends on termination of consensus, but they've done a lot of optimizations of that. We do uh, consensus only for reconfigurations. On the other hand, uh, we only support read and write operations, whereas Paxos is uh, getting the benefit of, of uh, higher level, more powerful uh, operations. Okay, so ready for some impossibility results? Okay, so these are all things that you can do and how you reason about systems. Okay, so this is the second major thread I'm talking about today, impossibility results. Okay, so distributed systems have very strong inherent limitations because they have to work in these impossible settings, very difficult settings. Each uh, node has information just about what happens locally and there's un complete uncertainty about what's happening remotely. Inputs, timing, failures. So once we put all of this on a theoretical basis, we're able to actually prove um, what these limitations are. This doesn't make sense without any formal, formal modeling. So the first place I heard of something like this, and this is kind of inspiring, was by um, two guys named Kremers and Hibbert at U University of Southern California, where I was at the time. Um, <clears throat> so 
they uh, were not looking at distributed systems, they were looking at shared memory systems. So you have shared memory uh, with Boolean shared variables and arbitrary operations to, that, that the processors could perform <coughs> on the shared variables. And they wanted to solve a mutual exclusion problem that was supposed to be fair. Every processor that requests the resource is eventually supposed to get it. And they proved that this is not possible for two processes or processors uh, with one Boolean shared variable. Okay, so how do you do that? Um, well, um, they basically uh, did a case analysis. They, they just looked at the problem requirements and then they construct a bunch of executions and they show that they can't all give you the right answers because the processors are limita limited just by what they can see locally. So if things look the same to a process, it's going to do the same thing, and then you can get a contradiction. Ah, so this is pretty nice. You suddenly realize that this is actually the kind of thing you can do in uh, distributed algorithms. Okay. So, um, well, the first thing we did was, was continue their work on um, impossibility for mutual exclusion. I'll show you one of, of these results. This is a bound not on um, the, yeah, I mean, we, we did a lot of work that, that looked at how many values you need for shared variables, that sort of thing. But this paper is about not the number of values, but on how many variables you need to get mutual exclusion. Okay, so the theorem here is that mutual exclusion for n processes using just read-write shared memory needs at least n shared variables. Okay, so if you only have, var variables can only uh, be accessed by reads and writes, um, and you have n processes, you better have enough variables. And this is true even if you don't need, don't require fairness but you just require the system to continue to make progress, meaning if somebody wants the resource, someone should get it. Um, you also allow everybody to be able to read and write all the variables, because if the variables only you know, have single writers, then of course you need enough variables one per process. But even if everybody can write all the variables, you still need enough uh, variables. And it doesn't matter whether they're Boolean or can have even an infinite number, take on an infinite number of possible values, um, still uh, this impossibility result holds. You still need n variables for n processes to sort out mutual exclusion. Okay, so let's, I'll just show you one example, which is two processors and, and one variable. Okay, so suppose you have processes P1 and P2. They solve mutual exclusion. As long as they continue to make progress, it's okay. We don't have to have, be fair to both of them. And suppose we can do that with only a single read-write shared variable called x. Okay, so let's see what might happen. Suppose the first process, p1, arrives, then he wants the resource. Okay, we have this progress requirement that says if anybody wants a resource, somebody must be able to get it. So that means since process one is the only one around, he has to be able to get the resource. Okay. Now, as he's going into the, that means going into the critical region. As long, along the way, before he goes into the critical region, I'm claiming that he has to write to the shared variable. Because what if he doesn't? Then the other process wouldn't know that he's there. Okay. And if the other process doesn't know he's there, it could, if it came in, it could then go get the resource too. It would have to because it might be the only one there. And if he goes in, then you've got two of them in the critical region. Okay, so P1 has to write the, to the single shared variable. Okay, so process arrives. This is the first time he writes to that shared variable, and then he would move on and get the resource. But now let's look at this, yeah? Is writing here like locking? The lock? So no, just a blind write. Oh. It overwrites whatever's there. Okay, so now let's look at an execution in which the process, process one does, does this, but he stops just before it writes for the first time. So he's going to stop right here. He's poised to write, about to write, but he doesn't actually perform the write. Now I'm going to let process two come in, just at the point where process one is paused. Okay, 
So process, uh, since process one has not written, process two thinks it's alone. And so it has to get the resource. Because there's an alternative world in which process two is the only one there, and, and he's forced to get, uh, get the resource then. OK, so he gets the resource. And similarly to what we just argued, along the way, it has to write to the variable. OK, so let's let process two um, write to the, go to the critical region, and he writes to the variable. After he does this, so we have the execution going this way and down there. Now let's resume process one. What's the first thing process one does? It writes to the one and only variable, thereby overwriting whatever process two wrote. So he's hiding the presence of process two. Okay? So, uh, yeah. Then process one can't tell the difference. So he just acts the same way he did on this top branch and goes into the critical region. And now you have both of them in the critical region. Okay, So that's just a core idea. It gets more complicated when you have more processes and more variables, but this is basically the idea. Yeah? I'm not saying that this would solve the problem, but wouldn't it be a good idea to read the variable first? Doesn't matter. Yeah, he could read the variable uh, here. Doesn't matter. Nobody knows that he's read it. He's invisible if he just reads it. Property of reads and writes. OK. So if you have more processes, it's the same sort of thing. Um, it's just a more intricate argument, more of the same. Um, the ideas are writing to a shared variable, overwrites whatever was there before. And um, locality, a process sees only its own state and the values that it reads from the shared variables. All right. So now let me go on and say something about consensus impossibility results. OK. Um, so we, we, did, we moved on to studying consensus. And there were quite a, a few papers that we did. I listed a few that you might find interesting. And I'm just going to talk about two of them. One is a lower bound on the time to uh, reach agreement in a synchronous system. And the other one is the impossibility of reaching agreement in an asynchronous system. Okay, try to just give you the key ideas for both of them. So this is just the same slide as before. Um, what's co distributed consensus? Reviewing what's agreement and validity. Okay. So let's look at the lower bound in synchronous systems first. So where we were is we we knew that all the known algorithms for reaching consensus in in synchronous systems had used at least f plus 1 rounds to reach consensus if you might have up to f faulty processes. OK, so this proof shows that this is inherent. You actually need f plus 1 rounds in the worst case, even if you only have simple stopping failures um, and if you want to tolerate f failures. OK, so the proof idea here, suppose you have an f round agreement algorithm that tolerates f false, f failures. I'm going to reach a contradiction. And we make some simplifying assumptions that don't really matter. You have a, a complete graph. And er, anybody can talk to anybody. The decisions are just binary decisions. You're deciding 0 or 1. Um, the decisions all get made at the end. And everybody can communicate with everyone else. Oh, and they actually do communicate at every round. So let's just do the special case. There's no one fault uh, stopping agreement algorithm where all the non-faulty processes decide at the end of round one. Okay, So you can't have a one round protocol that decides on uh, after round one. Suppose you have one. OK. So now this is a chain argument, which has been used in many places since then. Uh, we can construct a chain of executions. Each one will have at most one failure, so it's allowed. Um, the first execution is designed that it has to have uh, the decision value 0. The final execution 
is designed to have decision value, that it must have the decision value 1. Now, any two consecutive executions in this chain look the same to some process. So that process is going to decide the same in both of the executions. So we're going to creep slowly from one extreme to the other, and at every stage, there's going to be uh, one non-faulty process. It's non-faulty in both of the executions, so we have to act the same, decide the same way in both of those. So how do you, you get from all zero, from zero decisions to one decisions when you can't make a change at any, any step? Okay. So this would imply the decision values in the endpoint executions would have to be the same, which is a contradiction. So I'll just illustrate this. Um, okay, the first execution, alpha zero, has everybody with input zero and no failures. And uh, the last one has everybody with inputs one and no failures. And we'll start the chain from alpha zero, all inputs zero and no failures. No failures is, is seen by all the messages getting through. Okay. So now the second execution in the chain is alpha one. Let's just remove one message, the message between process one and two. Okay. These two executions are indistinguishable to everybody except for process one and process two. So they're indistinguishable, certainly, to some non-faulty process. And then we can, so we have to have the same decision value in those two. And then we could remove the message from one to three at the next step. And that's indistinguishable to everybody except process one and process three. So it's still indistinguishable to some non-faulty process. And just go on. Next one is eliminating the message from 1 to 4. Okay, So this way you can eliminate all the messages from process, uh, process 1 to everyone else. And you, it, along the way, you still have the uh, executions looking the same to some non-faulty process. Okay, So now what do we do? Um, we've removed all of process 1's messages, so now we can take another step in the execution chain and just change process one's initial value. Pretend that now we have an execution where it starts with a one and fails at the beginning, whereas he started here with a zero and failed at the beginning. But no one else can tell the difference. Okay, and now I think you can see what will happen. We, well, we can't just keep removing messages. We have to put back all the messages from process one, one at a time before we start doing the same thing and removing messages from process two. Because we can't have two of them failing in the same execution. So we replace all the messages from process one, and then you have this. Initial values are one, zero, 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 and nobody's faulty. And that still has to look the same as the original execution. It has to have the same decision value. And you just keep doing this with all the other processes, and you creep all the way to the end where you have everybody's initial value being 1. And yeah, so that's where you get the contradiction because you've just done one step at a time. You can't change the decision value in one step, so you can't have different decision values at the beginning and end. OK, question? So now I'm going to skip the next part, which is you can extend this to more rounds. It's basically um, just the same kind of argument, but with way more complicated chain <coughs> constructions. Where now you have to worry about, if you're worried about two round algorithms, you'll have to fail two processors in the same execution. One at the first round, one at the second. But let's forget that one for now. Okay, because I wanted to make sure this time to do this as the, I guess, the best known impossibility result in this area? That's a quick question. So yeah. that proves that even that uh, it's not possible even if there's no failure. No, if you know there's no failure. No, 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 you don't know that. But if failure does not occur, you still cannot have the in one round, correct? Yeah, if there's a possibility. If there's a possibility. Right, right, right. right. That's what the proof is. Yeah. So it's stronger than, I guess, that you're trying to say that, I guess. Yeah, but if you're conditioning on there being no failures, that's like the process should know there are no yeah, failures. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, so this is the, the FLP uh, argument. Um, 
So this is impossibility of consensus in asynchronous systems. Even if there's only one process that can stop without warning, it's still impossible for the non-faulty processes to reach agreement reliably. And this is uh, true even if at most one process ever fails, and everyone knows at most one process will ever fail. So, sorry, again, same thing, right? In the presence of a possibility of failure, is that a better way of saying it, or is that the, am I understanding it correct? Impossibility consensus in the presence of a possibility of failure. So the might yeah, 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 it's a possibility, but you know that the po there's a possibility of at most one failure. Correct, possibility. Yeah, possibility of at most one failure. It's not necessary that it occurs. That's right. And, there's a, and, and the other thing is a fail process here just stops, doesn't do anything. Yeah. So is the failure here presenting failure, or is it just uh, non-responsive <coughs> failure? It just stops. Okay. It's asynchronous. It? Asynchronous, what? so you can't do timeouts or anything like that. It's just... You just how, how does it give the decision one instead of zero then, if it's not presenting failure? Uh, we're going to show impossibility, so we can't. Okay. 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 Um, all right, so this result actually seemed counterintuitive uh, to a lot of people at the time, because it seems like if you have many, many processes, but you know at most one will fail, then why can't all but one agree and then just tell the remaining process if he, in fact, hasn't failed. Just tell him when he wakes up. But that doesn't work. So that's the surprising thing about it. Seems like it should work. OK, so again, we have to, all these proofs go by contradiction. So assume you have a one fault tolerant asynchronous algorithm that solves consensus. And we're just going to use the problem requirements to show that it can't work. Again, binary decisions are enough. And now, well, model and execution by a sequence of steps. Um, there's no rounds anymore because it's asynchronous. It's just a sequence of individual process steps. What happens in a step? A process receives a message from the channel, updates its state, and sends a finite number of messages out. There's some startup stuff at the beginning. So um, we're going to assume, in fact, that the channel's reliable. Every message eventually gets delivered. So an execution is just going through a sequence of global configurations of the system. Okay. Um, again, if you have an execution where everybody starts with a zero, they can only decide zero, and the same with one. But if the inputs are mixed, either decision is allowed. Okay, so the key here is that you show that there has to be some fine dividing line. The algorithm must have a, a pattern that's a reachable where there's four configurations that look like this. Uh, you have configuration C0 that can lead to another configuration D0 in one step. And in that step, a process PI uh, receives a message M from the channel. The same way D1 follows from C1 um, by the same process I receiving the same message in the channel. But the difference between C0 and C1 in between, there's some other process, some process PJ that receives a message M prime from the channel. Okay. So we just have different way, orders in which P, I can receive M either before or after the step of PJ. And yet, after um, D0, only a decision of zero is going to ever occur. Say that it's now zero valent. Look at all the possible extensions of the execution. The only decisions are zero. And with C1, with D1, the only extensions have decision values of one. Okay. And if you want to see quickly how you know that you have this kind of, uh, that you can isolate a decision in this way, localize a decision in this way. Um, if that doesn't happen, we could force the algorithm, we can just keep the algorithm undecided. We could make it continue to take steps forever without anybody ever deciding. And of course, that's going to be a contradiction to the termination. And this is just another slide that gives a little bit more detail on that. Suppose we don't get this pattern. How are we going to make the processors continue to take steps and nobody ever decides? 
Well, we're going to start with an undecided bivalent uh, execution. We can prove that exists. And then we're going to continue forever, letting every message get delivered in turn while keeping the execution undecided. So we're just going to stay on this uh, sharp edge and never fall uh, one way or the other. So how would we deliver some particular message? Well, if we can't ever deliver it and remain undecided, then no matter when we deliver it, it will cause a decision. But uh, both decisions of 0 and 1 are possible because we're in, we start in a configuration where both decisions are possible. So if both are possible, well, one could be by delivering it immediately, one could be a lot of other stuff happens, and then you deliver it. But you can sort of commute the steps inward until you get this configuration where they just happen with one intervening step. OK, so good. So you get this kind of a configuration, and now you get an easy contradiction. It's just two cases. Uh, if these two processors are different, these are two different processors, um, OK. so. What happens if you, now let's just close this, um, is it like a diamond shape, if after D0 you let PJ receive message M prime? Okay, so in one case you're delivering process, uh, process I is receiving message M, and then process J is receiving M prime, and that has to be zero valent. In the other case, they have the two steps happen in the other order, but then it has to be one valent. But that's pretty much nonsense, because you have two separate processors receiving two separate messages. There's no connection between them. It doesn't matter what order those things happen in. So you can't determine that the system is going to decide one way in one case and the other way in the other case, because it looks the same to the entire system after those two, two possible sequences of steps. Okay, And then the other... Uh, possibility as well, maybe these are just the same process receiving two different messages. Um, ah, but in this case, we can just imagine what happens if we kill that process right after this initial, we're allowed to play with one failure, so it will kill the process right after C0. Okay, if everybody else took steps except for pr that process I, they'd have to decide something. But you could run that same execution from D0 or from D1. And they don't see anything. The only process that's doing anything in these steps is that one process I. So the others would behave exactly the same in all of those cases. So you can't, they can't distinguish the two situations. OK, so this is obviously going very fast, but I think you can, this is enough to try to maybe read the paper and think about why it works. OK. All right, so the, the significance for distributed systems, well, we know this is an important problem in practice for database commit. Um, and so this basically shows the limitations on the kind of algorithm you could hope to find. And how do you get around it? You could use random choices, but then you just get like consensus with high probability. You could rely on timing assumptions. Or you could do what we've done in our paper and uh, Leslie Lambert has done, you weaken the requirements so that you don't re require um, agreement, validity, and termination in all cases. Just require the safety property should always hold, and termination uh, is just required when the system stabilizes to something uh, workable. OK, so I think we're I'm out of time. So I'm not going to finish the rest, but I will uh, give you the slides. The rest of this is going to be, uh, there's a list of all kinds of other impossibility results for timing-dependent systems for communication. And I guess on this last slide, there was a, a reference to what uh, Nalini was mentioning, 100 impossibility proofs for distributed computing, and then uh, hundreds of, uh, that's a more recent paper by uh, uh, Faith Ellen and Eric Rupert. OK, so uh, the rest of this, which you can make available, is uh, the CAP theorem, which I think many of you have heard about in your classes. OK, so that's another uh, claim from the systems community that uh, can be explained using theory. And actually, people argue about what exactly the systems people meant and did we get it right. And then uh, I'm not going to tell you about the recent work in biology or anything. <laughs>
time for a couple of questions. While I'm going to dig up the code. Ah, uh, the code. Yes, I heard about this code. Anybody have questions? So then maybe I can start off with one. Okay. Um, you know, there's this uh, interesting intersection between correctness and performance, right? How can I get performance while still guaranteeing correctness? Um, and so, you know, when we design algorithms, we come up with ways of quantifying performance and how fast and how many messages and try to improve on that. So, are there um, specific insights that you have that, you know, one might want to look at when you're trying to look at trying to achieve both safety and performance? Other than what's in, I mean, the papers are... Um, no, the performance in very dynamic systems, which is what we're worried about now, is really hard to hard to understand, hard to analyze. It's all work in progress. So, can I have a question? So, uh, you started a lot of your work with transactions in mind, mm -hmm. and if you look at, let's say, what's going on in the most recent uh, push in IT, there's a lot of sensor-driven programming, and these systems, a lot of, a lot of sens sensor driven programming oh, sensors, yeah, right? Yeah. So, uh, IoT systems and so on. I wonder if you had thoughts along that direction as to what will the meaning of consensus be, what will the meaning of transactions be in this context? I'm sure there's lots of work to be done. I haven't done, but we've done um, in our work in like hybrid systems, cyber physical systems, and all that. We basically focused on verification, so modeling and verification, but uh, not, not design, not algorithm design so much. <coughs> This, some isolated results. Yeah, because if I'm, if I'm building an application with multiple different sensors, right, so readings of multiple sensors, there are timing delays in each of these things. So eventually, what property am I getting? If I observe a phenomena across multiple different sensors, eventually, what's the semantic meaning or something like that? So I wonder if you sort of, the ideas from consensus and ideas from this computing applies to something like that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So usually when we design these systems, we start out with these results and then start relaxing these constraints. Like you said, you know, let's say that we don't really want to have liveness or, you know, or we are willing to wait till termination happens. Now, in lots of systems, when you have real-time constraints, you can't wait till termination happens, so you work with some sacrificing some properties that says, okay, let me declare that you know, I'm going to go with the value that I have, and that can result in safety violations, right? Yeah, the trick is to get a handle on that. What can you guarantee? Like, how do you constrain how far out of state you can be? I should have looked up the code here, but I... No code? Um, I think it's called um, code, but I'm not to... <laughs> Arlan did send me the message, so... Um, I guess we'll have to excuse students for the code this time, so Make it we'll go ahead. Or something. Yeah. So just enter in FLP, and then we will um, adjust it in the back end. <laughs> <laughs> Make up the code now. Okay. Yeah. I can't find the.